We're now going to look at how the system response changes as we add zeros to the system. In general, as we've said before, changing zeros is not going to change the nature or the form of our response. So if we have an underdamped response before we have any zeros, we're still going to have an underdamped response after we add zeros. However, adding these zeros is going to affect the amplitudes of the various components. And so ultimately what this means is we could see changes in things such as percent overshoot. And so for a better visualization of what that looks like, I would encourage you to look at figure 4.25 on page 160 of the 8th edition textbook. And there's actually a little bit of MATLAB code right beside that figure, so you can plug it into MATLAB and you can make the figure yourself as well. So we're going to come at this problem a couple of different ways. First, let's consider a system with two poles and a zero that's on the real axis in the left half F plane, S plane. So let's consider a system that has two poles and a zero on the real axis. And we're also assuming that this zero is in the left half of the S plane. And so what that means is if we want to make a sort of simple uh, transfer function, we can say T of S is equal to, now for our zero, let's just say it's S plus A. So because we have S plus A, that indicates our zero is at a location of negative A, which is indeed in the negative in the left half plane. Uh, now for our two poles, let's just say there are some arbitrary locations, S plus B and S plus C. Well, we can sort of separate this out using our partial fraction expansion. So we're going to have some term capital A over S plus B plus some term B capital B over S plus C. And so remember these capital A and B here, these are just sort of variables that we're trying to solve for in order to be able to do our inverse Laplace transform. So we can go ahead and solve that out. And what we get is, let me actually do this down here on this next line. So I have plenty of space. So what we get is we have something over our S plus B and we have something over our S plus C. So it turns out that that capital A term becomes negative B plus A divided by negative B plus C, and our capital B term becomes negative C plus A divided by negative C plus B. Okay, so we get something that looks like that. So now we can make a sort of simplifying assumption. So let's assume that our zero is much further left in our S plane than either of our two poles. So similar to what we were talking about with adding a third pole, we said if that third pole is really far left, we can kind of ignore it. So we're gonna see if that's true for this zero as well. So if the zero is much further left, and so we'll emphasize much, than either of the poles. And so what that is saying is basically we have then A is gonna be much greater than B, and A is much greater than C, where B and C are the location of our two poles. So if that's true, then what we can say is that this T of S is approximately, so these terms in the numerator here, so this negative B plus A, well, if A is much bigger than B, that's approximately just A. Same thing here, if A is much greater than C, that term highlighted is approximately just A as well. So what we can do is we can factor out an A, and then in this first term, we just have one over negative B plus C divided by S plus B. And in our second term, we factored out that A, so we're left with negative one over C plus B divided by S plus C. Now, through some algebra, what we can show is that adding these two terms in the square brackets, uh, we basically get a one in the numerator and in the denominator, we just have the product of those two denominators. So we have S plus B times S plus C. And as I said, our numerator term goes to one. You can show that with the algebra. So we're left with just an A here. So comparing that to what we would normally have if we didn't have a zero, this just looks like a simple gain factor. 
So it looks like a simple gain factor. So in other words, it looks like we just came in here and we said, well, let's multiply this transfer function with two poles by some value A. And so as it turns out, um, the further left that A is, the further left that zero is, the better that, that approximation is going to be true. Um, but as that zero gets closer to our dominant poles, the more effect it's going to have on our transient response. So zero closer to our dominant poles, we're going to have more effect on our transient response. And so remember, it's not going to change the form of the transient response, rather it's just going to change things such as our percent overshoot. And so again, I would encourage you to go take a look at this figure and that'll show that a little more clearly. So let's consider this slightly differently. Let's say we have some output C of S and this is a response from a system with a transfer function T of S and we want to add a zero. So for system with a transfer function T of S and let's say we want to add a zero to that system. Well, maybe we don't want to, maybe it's been added for some reason beyond our control and we want to be able to analyze what that does. So our original transfer function T of S now becomes S plus A times T of S. So we're just multiplying that zero term. So same kind of basic idea we have up here. If we think about this being our, our transfer function, so one over that, and then we've multiplied by S plus A. Okay, so if we have that, then our output is now going to be given by S plus A times whatever the original output was without the zero, C of S. So of course we can factor that out, so we can say we have S times C of S plus A times C of S. And so we have these sort of two terms to consider here. What this first term is, is this is actually related to the derivative of our original response. So derivative of original response. And so the reason that I can say that is of course because we had our Laplace transform property of time differentiation. So remember, der deriving in time corresponds to multiplying by S in frequency. So this first term corresponds to the derivative of the original response whereas the second term is just a scaled version of the original response. So we've just multiplied that by A. So scaled version of original response. And so what we can see is that as A becomes large, so for large A value, our derivative term becomes negligible. So a derivative term can be ignored. And so that's the same thing that we saw before, just we came at it from a different way. So we said that if that zero is far enough left, we just have our original transfer function multiplied by some A. And so that's the same thing we're saying here. We're saying if this A is large enough, this term dominates, and we can essentially ignore this component. However, as that A is smaller, which corresponds to the zero being closer to our dominant poles, then we need to consider that derivative term. Um, a couple other things I'll mention. Um, we can also have zeros in the right half plane. So four zeros in our right half plane. If our magnitude of A is small, then our response can, also, can initially be in the opposite direction. So response can initially be in opposite direction from the steady state value. And so what we call this type of system is a non-minimum phase system. Let me make that somewhat legible. So non-minimum 
phase system. And we're not going to deal with that at all in this class, but it's something I just wanted you guys to be familiar with. And so what that looks like graphically, if we have our C of T over time, so we have an underdamped response, we're gonna have some final value that we're shooting for, C of F. And so before what we said is we have something that goes like this. Well, what we're saying now is that for a non-minimum phase system, initially we might actually be going in the opposite direction before coming back and seeing that characteristic underdamped response type. Um, so that's something that we can see in certain cases when adding zeros. There are also certain cases where poles and zeros can cancel out. So poles and zeros can cancel out. And so as you would expect, this is only if they're close enough. So if they are close enough, we can't just randomly be canceling out poles and zeros, but this could sort of solve two problems with one. Maybe we have a third order system with a zero. Well, if one of the poles is close to one of the zeros, we can maybe approximate it as those two canceling out. So to see an example where that is the case, uh, you can look on page 163, so pages 163 and 164 in the 8th edition textbook. Uh, one other thing I want to briefly mention is that in section 4.9 of the textbook, it kind of qualitatively talks about effects of nonlinearities. So these include things such as saturation, which we can see in electric circuits as well as mechanical systems as well as dead zone and backlash associated with gears in a motor, for example. Uh, we don't have time to get into that here, but if that's something that is of interest to you, I encourage you to look into that. Um, but this is the end of our, our video or our videos on our time response.